Hello, everyone. It is time for this week's live stream. I already have something right on top of my face. Okay, it's gone. Uh, I have a special guest here today. His name is Richard Ross, and he is here from his secret lab in somewhere in California. It's a secret, so I can't tell you where. <laughs> he, he's up there somewhere up high where there's mountains and sequoia trees, and I think there's this huge bridge that's really famous. He's sort of near that, but I can't specify where because it's a secret. Yeah, you're, you're, you're taking that way too seriously, but I like it. <laughs> Someone needs to bring this up because it's a secret lab. You know, oh, well, it's called the secret home lab because um, when I was setting stuff up, uh, my comedy friends went, you should call it the secret home lab because that's funny. Nice. I, I said, yeah, you're right. That's right. That's what we'll call it. Hey, speaking of comedy, uh, I want to go ahead and ask you right quick. I am gonna get you that link you've been asking for too. one second here. Um, oh, I, found, I found it. Oh, you got it. You got it. Okay. I got it. All right. Perfect. Then I'm not going to worry about it. Uh, I wanted to know if by any chance... You, I'm going to put me on screen too so you don't feel so on the spot. If you feel, if you've ever done stand-up comedy. I uh, I haven't done, I think I did straight stand-up like once or twice mm -hmm. and hated it. But I did a lot of work at comedy clubs and stand-up, but, but as a prop comic, as a oh. juggler. Oh, yeah. So did that for 15 years. All so right. yeah, lots of that. I still want to do stand-up. I don't know why. <laughs> I just, oh, I, do it. You should I, totally do it. Take take a class that ends in a show. It's the easiest way to do it. Yeah. Well, I mean, the beauty is I have a show. I could literally just do a one-minute thing and stick it on every week. I could just plunk it in at the beginning. I could plunk it in on the end. I mean, yes, obviously, that is the cheater's way of doing it instead of actually going somewhere and standing in front of a real audience and taking a chance. But um, well, I have these well, crazy thoughts that come into my mind. I'm like, oh, that'd be hilarious. I should do that. That would be part should. of my bit. That would be my you bit. Should. The, the 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 musical was great I, yes I haven't responded no one knows about that it, but it's great <laughs> no one knows about that yet <laughs> oh sorry i didn't say what it was secret musical um, <laughs> um you should totally do it mark why are you not doing it that would be a fun one. Oh well you know because there's other things to do like coral magazine or i oh, don't well, know what? take care of a reef tank occasionally or you know uh, i don't know this youtube thing kind of dominates my life a little bit too yeah so, okay i understand then, then just talk about doing it instead of doing it <laughs> guys i want to show you something i'm gonna take a break from rich for a second here i just want to show you something new i got this week i went to batteries plus and i bought this thing so the reason i bought this is every time i have power outages and i have them a little bit more often than i'd like to uh you know accept and you guys know i have a generator but the generator keeps the reef alive then i have to run extension cords all over the place in the house to put you know like plug in the router plug in lights whatever but i can't see anything while i'm doing it so I'm running around like an idiot with my cell phone in one hand with a flashlight turned on. I'm trying to see, and you know, my hand is full. I can't stand it. So I said, I need some kind of light besides candles because I've been doing candles forever. So I got this thing. And uh, at Batteries Plus, I think this was like maybe 25, six, 26 bucks. It's got a button on the back and it's crazy bright. I mean, it's just like, it's insane. You hit it again and you got this lesser light at the top which I'll kind of cover up and you can kind of see. Anyway, it's it's plenty bright and it's got a tripod on the back so you can set it on the floor. If you're in a storm and you have to hook up a generator in the dark, you can put this thing on the ground. I, you know, this is not a sponsor thing. I'm just telling you something I spent money on. Um, and it's got a lithium battery that you recharge inside here. It comes with a cord. Here's the actual charging brick on the very top of it. Just holds right on, which I thought was nice. Keeps it all self-contained. So as long as I keep this somewhere super logical, as soon as a power outage happens, I know where to go to grab this first. Now I can go into the garage and because it's pitch dark and hook up the generator cable. Then I can go outside and get the generator out, hook it up, blah, blah, blah. But I wanted to show you guys this in case it was something of interest to you besides a standard flashlight or, you know, using your cell phone. Um, and then uh, I have huge, huge, huge good news because, and you guys probably know what, the, what this is already, but uh, this magazine has gone to press. <laughs> off my list of things to do i'm super happy about it coral magazine this is um the march april edition and it's about it's all about filtration it is filtration cover to cover and i hope that you find it fascinating because we did some really cool stuff that was um above and beyond what the magazine originally was where it was going i said i need this whole extra piece of content and uh, we interviewed five different manufacturers that are well known in this industry specifically for this huge article we included pictures from their companies and uh we i just it's it's so good 
And then there's some other stuff in there. There's some really cool news that's happened recently. You might have saw it on Facebook. Maybe not. I don't know. But uh, it's there in Reef Notebook at the beginning. This issue will be hitting your fish stores near you or coming to your mailbox in about two weeks. So that is something exciting I wanted to show with you guys. And uh, that is it for now. Let's come back to Rich. So oh, stayed right there on top of my face. All right, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> the beauty of a live stream, right? Yes. And of uh, editing so and Rich said that we should be talking about how critical thinking is more important than ever. And he gave me a whole list of things that we should be talking about. So let's talk about critical thinking at all, because that goes, that actually seems to lean into your whole, uh, what did you call it? The skeptical reef keeper. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, 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 how do you make decisions? Right. And, and it's not just in our hobby, but I think, uh, because I'm in our hobby, I care about it more in our hobby, but it's in everything. And, there's a million claims all the time about what you should be doing and what you should buy and what methodologies you should use and how do you decide what to do in all that information. Yeah. Um, and so there's, you know, critical thinking is really just a muscle and you can practice it and learn it. It's not, it's nothing special. It's nothing magic. Yeah. Although it feels like magic once you, once, once you know about it, it kind of feels like, how did I not know that before? Right. Um, so that's that's all it is. When somebody makes a claim, that, that's I'm going to try to stay away from jargon, but that's kind of, and I'm not going to talk about, I don't want to talk about um, um, fallacies or anything like that. It doesn't matter. It's somebody, you know, it, is that true or not? Should you, mm -hmm. should you believe that claim or not? Or yeah. how much you should believe that claim? Mostly it's a continuum, how much you think you can trust it rather than it being right or wrong. Um, and then in that, what, what, what I find in the hobby that we get caught up on a lot is proof and evidence. Mm -hmm. you know, what is proof and what is evidence? And so um, in philosophy, we don't like to use the word proof because proof is really just a mathematical thing. You can prove something in math, but um, in the real world, you don't really prove it because science, nothing is ever really settled in science. Everything could be overturned. So nothing's really, so saying something's proven is inaccurate mm -hmm. and it gives people the wrong idea. Um, you know, that's why sometimes people get mad when, you know, when, when cigarettes are really good for you, you'll lose weight, you should smoke cigarettes. And then 20 years later, it's like cigarettes are bad. That was, we were wrong. Yeah. Um, and people are like, but you said, it's like, yeah, but that's how it works. When we get new information, we change our minds about yeah. what we're doing or not. So th those are things I think are important. And, and so we're looking at evidence. And when I say evidence, I'm not, ta I'm talking about anything that is evidence. I'm not talking about a, a paper. I'm not talking about, um, you know, and let's talk about paper. We could talk about papers for a second. The issue I, that happens all the time with papers is people pull one thing out of the paper mm -hmm. and then they generalize that to everything. Okay. Right. Can you be more specific? Um, Just make a, make a fake illustration. Uh, I can, t I can give you a real one. Okay. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the, the phosphate makes coral skeletons, uh, high phosphate interferes with calcification. Okay. So uh, the person who wrote that paper would never say, this is what happens with all corals. All they would say in that paper is, of the coral we tested, this is what we found. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Or, um, you know, another example would be, um, we found, in this paper, we found that high phosphate leads to eutrophification, which makes uh, uh, corals die off. Mm -hmm. Algae grows. And, and so people will take that. It's like, okay, so high nutrients cause this and it's like that's not really what any of the science actually says there's right there's like three arms it's too broad. That cause it. right and and so scientific papers are great they're mm -hmm. useful but we can't over extrapolate from what they say yeah you know every paper says this is the small box we did this in yeah yeah and you know so you can't just add it you know so for like octopuses you know, people think octopuses all breed. They do the thing you hear about on Mother's Day where, you know, and then uh, they 50,000 eggs hatch yeah. and then the, and then the mother dies. Yeah. Like, that's not how it works for all octopuses. Hmm. 
So, you know, know you, you have to be looking at what you're actually looking at, yeah. not the broad thing. And sometimes papers are wrong. Mm -hmm. So uh, over extrapolating from a paper, over generalizing from a paper, jumping to conclusions from paper, you should really put a big squint on that. Um, okay. Papers are great and you yeah. can get really, really nice evidence from a paper, yeah. but then you have to look at it in a larger context. It's, um, it's not, papers are not an answer book. Mm -hmm. um, and most papers end with, this is what we saw, more work needs to be done here. Yeah, right. You know, and that's, uh, so papers are great, um, but they're not the end all of evidence. We're looking for evidence. And what I like to call it is uh, I'm looking for compelling evidence, mm -hmm. evidence that compels me to believe the thing that somebody just said. Right. Um, yeah, so that's that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. That's what started the skeptical reef keeping series. And what's really funny is yesterday, you know, and that the first skeptical reef keeping was about ginger. There was a big chunk yes. in their thing about using ginger <laughs> yep. um, to cure ick. Yep. And uh, marine. You ick. were really against that. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's no evidence for it. Uh, that, that's the thing, right? Yeah. Um, and yesterday there was a whole new thread on one of the forums about you know, using ginger. And oh. I was like, yeah. And like, like, I, like I predict, you were waiting. Never, this will never <laughs> I've got an like article. Every, <laughs> every five or 10 years, this is going to come back. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Um, there's no new evidence that ginger works, right. but the, 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 the hypothesis, what, what, what I think happens with people is we come up with a hypothesis of how thing we think things might work. Yeah. And um, sometimes we never get farther than that. We just assume that that becomes how it actually is. Mm -hmm. And that's where we run into problems and things can never go away. You know, so the ginger one, you know, we're never going to get rid of people saying we should use ginger. It's yeah. just never going to stop. Um, but it will go, it will, you know, it will wax and wane over time. I remember when um, it first appeared and you were so against it. And I was like, why are you so against it? I mean, what if it works? You're like, it doesn't. I was like, but what if it does? What if scientists can prove it does? I'm like, they're not going to, it's not going to happen. And I was just like, wow, you're really anti-ginger, Rich. <laughs> I'm, 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 I was, it's not anti-ginger. It's anti the way of thinking because yeah. it causes people to try it. <laughs> to, 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 to not treat sick animals. Yeah. Um, and to add ginger and, yeah. you know, there's no evidence that ginger really does anything significant at all. Yeah. yeah. And I find that to be worrisome. I don't, you know, I, you know, I mean, come on between the two of us, we know turmeric is way better, way oh, more efficient. I, I would go with <laughs> saffron if it was up to me. Um, all right. So let me jump. Uh, I, there was a story that came up my Facebook feed, uh, Tia Davis, you probably follow her as well. Uh, she found a story that was a paper that was peer reviewed, I think in a scientific publication, scientific website that was completely written by AI. And yet oh, yeah. people were proving it. And they were basically approving the completely fictional, fake, completely non-real story that could not possibly happen if you started to really look at it. And how did the reviewers not pick up on this is physically impossible? Yeah, well, there's all there's all kinds of problems with peer review yeah. as it stands now. Yeah. And with the erosion of the erosion of experts actually having expertise, the erosion of the idea that experts that you should listen to experts. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's so fascinating, Mark, because you should always question experts right but but really you've got to you've got to know stuff yourself to be able to question an expert yeah. in any kind of meaningful way right yeah i i i'm not going to go to the doctor and go well you know when when you're doing the surgery on me you know i really want you to leave all those parts in there it's like i i i don't yeah i don't have the background to have a cogent conversation right. about surgical techniques yeah right yeah. And watching a YouTube video is not enough, right? Really? Uh, <laughs> of course, that's that's. But but watching YouTube videos, you can educate yourself, but yeah. but you can't. You have to be careful about digging in against somebody who has studied it. Now, yeah. of course, people who study it can be wrong. That's yeah. you know. So so we should be watching for that. Are we getting a bad vibe? Yeah. Um, and that's why you. I'm sorry. Back to evidence to say you know uh, every every 
every report on something is evidence, mm -hmm. you know, anecdotal evidence, people, people, you know, I wrote a whole article about the power of anecdote. Anecdote is really useful mm -hmm. um, to build on, you yeah. know, and sometimes all we have is somebody told me that this was a thing. Um, you know, I, I, you know, when somebody tells you that, then how are you going to convince yourself that they know what they're talking about? And then how are you going to test what they said? Yeah. Or, or are you just going to do what they say? Because, you know, you're, you're new and why wouldn't you do that? Which is, which is the horrible part, yeah. right? New people coming into any hobby, they don't know what to do. They don't have any legs under them to know what's credible and what's not and what yeah. makes sense and what doesn't. And so it's, it's hard. You've got to, you've got to slog your way through the beginner stages before you have any idea of what you actually need to know. Let's jump into that here. This is the perfect time to bring that up. So I've got this graphic on the screen. I'm trying to move this thing out of the way. Oh my God, why won't it move? I don't know. The more I move it, the less it wants to get out of the way. It really likes you. Jeez. All right, fine. <laughs> but bye there, it's gone. So this right here is the Dunning-Kruger effect. It's a graph. I learned about this from Felicia about, I feel like three, four years ago, she brought it up. She goes, it's real. And I was like, what the heck is she even talking about? And so I jumped into Google to learn what this phrase was because I'd never heard of it. And mm. maybe some of you viewers have heard of it. Maybe you haven't. But Rich brought it up specifically. And I was like, fine, I will prep for this part. So <laughs> uh, I will read the description first and then we'll get into it. So according to the Dunning-Kruger effect, people tend to overestimate their cognitive ability until slash unless their competence increases to the point where they become aware of their shortcomings. So let's look at this graph. I'm going to stay off of here for a second. I'll just, you know, be the voice in Rich's head. Okay. Can you make that graph bigger? No one I needs can. to see my face. I can make it the like whole screen. Oh, <laughs> there we big. go. Here, I'll shrink it down a little bit. So it's, it's, it's how confident you are in something and how competent you are against something graphed yeah. against each other. How, how much you actually really know and how confident you are in what you know. Yeah. And the idea is you start when you know nothing. And as you are initially learning something, your confidence level shoots through the roof. Mm -hmm. But your competence level is still, you still don't know much. But yeah. you feel like you know a lot because you're learning stuff and you're very excited. Mm -hmm. And derogatorily, they call it the peak of Mount Stupid <laughs> uh, in the graph because it goes yeah. up and then drops again, right? Yeah. And, and, mm -hmm. Boy, I think back to stuff. I think the kiteboarding stuff. I think the juggling. I think the comedy. Yeah. I think that, you know anything I've ever been involved in. Um, woodworking. You know, I bought a saw, and now here we go. You know, and then you get <laughs> you get three steps into whatever you're building, and it's just a pile of useless pieces of wood because right. you don't know what you're doing. Yeah. Um, and once you kind of figure out that you don't know what you're doing, really, you know a little tiny bit, then you get really sad, and you. <laughs> And you crash because you realize how much you might have to learn to be able to actually know what you're talking about. Yeah. And that's called um, the valley of despair. <laughs> you just, you, you, and you can see it on the graph. It drops back down to where you're totally in comp. You're still building competence, mm -hmm. but you, you don't know, but you're, but you're sad because you, you, you're not confident in what you know. Right. Your confidence level has dropped significantly. Right. The stuff uh, you thought you knew. You, 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 find you, didn't, out you, didn't. you didn't know correctly. Right. And so you're despairing now. Yes. Right. So in let's see. Oh, let's just go through it. And then maybe we'll make up a reef keeping example about it. No, let's do it now. Okay. You get your tank, right? <laughs> yeah. And you um and you put uh, um you put a check valve in your main return. Okay. Um and then uh and you feel great and you tell everyone that they should do check valves. Check valves are great. I tested it, it works. It's the best. It yeah. stops everything. I don't understand why people aren't using check valve. Yes. Boy, people are stupid for not using check valve. Mm -hmm. So I'm up at the top of peak amount stupid. <laughs> uh, and then, you know, a snail goes through the overflow because you don't even know enough that you should block the overflow and that snails going through an overflow are bad. Yeah. It goes down your thing and it blocks your, uh, it goes down your drain and it blocks your check valve. Because you got check valves everywhere because you love them. They're in the return, they're in the drains, they're everywhere. Right? The snail gets in your plumbing and gets to the check valve and blocks the check valve. And then you need the check valve to be working and it doesn't. And you flood everything. 
and you go into the valley of despair because not only have you flooded everything, not only did you get knocked off the perch of where you felt like, I know what I'm doing, I'm so happy. Mm -hmm. uh, but then you ask some people and they go, oh yeah, check valves break, man. Don't use check valves. Snails yeah. get into check valves. There's a reason most people don't use check valves. Right. And then you despair even more because you're like, oh God, I thought I knew everything. Mm -hmm. Then if you don't run away from the hobby, you start going, okay, so what do I need to know to make this more robust? To make, you know, what do I want to happen with a check valve? How do I do it without a check valve? Yeah. And so what do I do? And you just start slowly climbing up what they call the slope, slope of enlightenment, yeah. where you're learning stuff, but you're not quite confident of what you know, and you're certainly not telling other people as much of what to do. <laughs> exactly. Start, That's a very important part. <laughs> right. You start, you start hedging yourself you start yeah. saying you know well in my experience this is what happened mm -hmm. right because you, you if you tell people because all the people who you told to use check valves are still mad at you right because they had the same experience you did yeah and over time you 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 start to feel more confident about what you know and you hit what they call the the uh plateau of stability of sustainability, sustainability yeah sustainability mm -hmm. yeah. where um it's all working out you 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 the amount that you know uh, that works out in reality mm -hmm. sustains itself, and and you're and you you actually know stuff. Yeah. Um, and you can be confident that you know stuff. Um. So, I, the the thing that occurred to me interestingly about this recently, which is, I've been thinking a lot about why experienced people aren't posting on forums, mm -hmm. why they stay away from Facebook groups. Um, you know, and that's always been a thing, you know, ever, you know, people after a few years, they just kind of vanish yeah. uh, from the scene a little bit. They get very and, quiet at, at the very least. <clears throat> yeah. So there's two things that happen there. One, they know what they don't know and they, and they, and they don't feel like just telling people what to do mm -hmm. because, because they know they can't do that. Right. Mm -hmm. But people want to be told what to do. Yeah. And there's plenty of people, you know, closer to the peak of Mount Stupid, who would tell people what to do? Yeah. Um, so experts, people, experienced folks just start, you know, and then they don't want to get in fights anymore with people right. on the peak of Mount Stupid, right? Yes. You know, it's like the surgeon, when you tell your surgeon yeah. that, you know, start giving them, you know, little bit of nothing information about what they should cut and what they should not. Right. You know, the surgeon doesn't talk to you about that. They go, okay and go on with their life and never talk to you again because you don't you don't have any background on it yet right um so that that's why i think people stop stop they, they back off they don't mm -hmm. want to fight um they're interested in learning new stuff they're interested in telling people what they know yeah but they also know what they don't know so they don't want people just to take them as um take you know take them as gurus mm -hmm. and just listen to them yeah. Uh, some people do. Some people really get off on that. Mm -hmm. um, that's always been hard for me. Um, and it, you know, what am I actually expert in? What do I? Nothing. I mean, I know I know stuff about stuff, but am I an expert? You know, I don't even know what that means. So I, I'm probably too careful on that side. On. Um, what, what did that thing say again? I can't remember. Which one? Something about master of time and space. Master of time, space, and dimension. That's a <laughs> That's another joke. I'm that not, seems like I, a really strong guru to me right there. I'm I should make that angry. bigger because you're so important. There. Well, you know, maybe <laughs> the problem screen. I had with the, with the idea of a guru is that I know that there's so many scammy, scammy things that happen when people claim guru status. Yeah. Um, and then you also get into arguments from authority where they start saying, you know, I'm a guru, so you should just believe me. And, and it gets so weird because I think when reefers are starting out, they want to be told what to do. And to a certain extent, they just need to be told what to yes. do. It's no, you know, you're not going to go, only the rare reefer is going to go read for six months yeah. uh, before they do anything. Yeah, it's very rare. So I get that. I yeah. get that. Um, I, I, I just don't like it when people are taking advantage of it with that. And, and what really happens in that situation is you listen to this person a little bit and you listen to this person a little bit and you listen to that person a little bit. And yeah. then you come and you ask someone like you, Mark, a question and you yeah. go, man, you're all over the place. I, I, we got to go all the way back yeah. and kind of level you out here. So you're, you're working at not working at cross purposes because yeah. different methodologies do different things. Yeah. No, so. it's a real problem. Uh, you know, I've, I mentioned this before 
you ask a question on Facebook, for example, oh. and there's like 20 completely different answers. And probably 50% are actually right. <laughs> but right. at the same time as the original, I'm trying to put myself in the place of the original person asking the question. I have 20 totally different answers to my question. How do I know which one to go with? Literally, it's too many answers. I If I want to just know the answer, I need 19 people to agree. Like that, you know, for example, let's say we're saying it's a pest. That is definitely Aptasia. Everyone says it's Aptasia. Okay, it's Aptasia. Let me Google Aptasia. You know, at least now I know. But when you got a guy that says cucumber, another guy that says stingray, another guy that says Aptasia, another guy that says Mahano, and you're just like, I mean, I remember I'd go through threads like that in the past. And I would, and I'd say not Mahano, not Stingray, not Shark, not Anemone. <laughs> oh, and they're right. just like, well, then what is it? It's the same thing. I'm like, no, it's not. It's a totally different creature. It's a completely different species. I'm sorry. Let's just not throw noise into the conversation. Let's at least give them the correct answer or just scroll past and don't say anything at all. Right, right. So like, <clears throat> um, I know what a bobbit worm is. Mm hmm. I've had my hand on one. I think the only other person I know is Matt. That's Lamont. what she said. <laughs> uh, and 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 I've given up correcting people about bobbit worms. Yeah. It's it's you know people call every worm a bobbit worm. Yeah. And it's not. Yeah. And it's just not. People 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 hate people hit you when you tell them that it's not a bobbit worm. Yeah. They're like shut up. No <laughs> one cares. It's like but we okay all right all right man just you know. Yeah. Um, you know, eventually they'll go, oh, wait, it's, you know, if they stay with it long enough, they'll go, oh, it's not a bobbit worm. A bobbit worm is huh. actually a thing. Yeah. And we've never seen them in Aquaria. Okay. Right. Um, you know, but how much do you want to have that fight? You yeah. know, how much do you want to have that argument? Yeah. Um, you know, I feel the same way. I get, I see threads and I'm like, I'm not even going to answer next. And I just keep going because yeah. it's like, uh, and it's like what you brought up earlier. The experts just don't want to say anything at this point because they don't want to get into the fight. And I do right. kind of get that. Yeah. And, you know, I also think it's good because it gets the people, the experienced folks out of the way for new people to try stuff on. Mm -hmm. Right. So on the other side of the pink amount stupid, or maybe when you're coming up the slope of enlightenment, mm -hmm. um, that's when you're the most active on forms, I think. Um, you've got ideas. You want to see if they work. You yeah. want to see if other people agree. You, you know, you, you want to test it out. And a great way to learn is to teach. So you mm -hmm. start teaching what you think you do know, and that's great. That's wonderful. Um, <clears throat> but as you get more experienced, you, it gets harder and harder for you to let little things go because you know a little thing is going to translate into a problem later on. Yeah. And I don't – okay, you figure it out. You you guys all have energy and excitement. You should be totally doing that. And 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 people who are more experienced should be totally like going, ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. At some point, maybe someone will ask me and then I'll help, but I'm not getting involved in that because I shouldn't. It's the same reason why every five or eight years you get – like a yellow tang article. Mm -hmm. Yellow tangs are great herbivores. And it's like, we've covered that. The hobby has so covered that for mm -hmm. 30, 40 years. Yeah. Doesn't matter. It's, it needs to be said again in a new voice with a new perspective. Mm -hmm. um, but you also got to remember what happened before. There was some brouhaha recently about a couple of articles on some online, uh, you know, online outlets about, or one was online, one wasn't. Uh, about articles about um, um, snails, uh, stomatellas. Okay. And is, is this the uh, ASL of stomatella? I'm just trying to. That, that was the, R, <laughs> the RSL, the rich sign language. It was me trying to. I had to. The helmet. And I wearing the stomatella, you know. Um, the stomatella, we know about stomatella for a million years. You know, everyone's seen them spawn in their tank. Everyone's yeah. seen them drop tail. Not everyone. People who have been around, right? Yeah. All right? But every few years or so, someone's got to write an article about stomatella snails yeah. because people are interested in stomatella snails. Mm -hmm. What was interesting I found with, the, uh, um, with these two articles was they were both articles that were just like, stomatella snails are great, and here's some information. Nothing new, no, no, nothing earth shattering, no really new novel information. Right. Just a, you know, um, 
I want to say retreading, but that sounds negative. It's yeah. just another, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's saying what we know again in a new, in a new form to a new audience yeah. who may not have seen it before, who may not have gone and, you know, looked for anything. Right. Uh, or, you know, gone, gone back and read about it. So it's good. New audiences need to have the same things told to them. Yeah. But there, there was like some little fight about, you know, they were saying these articles are too much the you know, the, the new art, the new article is too much like the old article and you should be, you know, referencing the old art, you know, the, the, mm. the article that was a year earlier. And there was like this bad blood. Mm. It was like, there's too similar. It's clearly ripped off. And it was like, so I went and looked at the first article, which mm. was just last year. Yeah. And it was like, you know, when someone was even saying you, well, you should have made a reference or made a citation to the early article. Yeah. And there were no citations in the earlier article. And right. all the information <laughs> in the early article was, was gotten from somewhere, you That's know, true. from, you know, yeah. Um, so I thought that was pretty funny. It was like, whoa, whoa, you, you didn't make up Stomatella. You're not the first people to talk about Stomatella. That's true. Um, so you should be looking backwards and going, if you're going to write something, you should read what was written before yeah. and credit it because it does, you know, pro it, it only makes you look more credible yeah. that you said for further reading here, this is where I got some of this information here, here, and here. Yeah. It's, you know, it's a tiny paragraph at the end of an article. Um, you know, which I'm very familiar with now with Coral right. Magazine. I mean, but that's why yeah. that's why you learned that in high school and junior yeah. high school. That's why mm -hmm. you did bibliographies. Yeah, that's the point. Um, you know, is you know, how much do you want to reference in a blog post? You know, don't yep. do a don't do an end thing. Just put it. You know, right. you put the link right in there. Yep. But I think I think we owe it to the hobby <coughs> to not forget what came before. Yeah, because that'll save us time and and despair. Right. You know, it's it, has this been done before? What did somebody else say about ginger? You know, that kind of stuff. What did people say about check valves? Yeah. So I there. love that you brought up ginger. That just makes me so happy. <laughs> well, I wasn't going to. It came up. It came up yesterday. I, I was laying That's in bed. That's hilarious. Are, are you serious? <laughs> um, did you say, are you Mark Levinson under a different username? No. <laughs> I, I, I linked I linked the skeptical reef for keeping one. Mm -hmm. But I don't like to say who I am because mm -hmm. no one cares, right? Yeah. Which is fine. Um, and then there was something like, "Oh, well, that's him." And the, oh, I didn't know that. It's like, you know, I don't care. It's it's not about me. It's about the information, right? Oh, of course, yeah. So, and I guess I should say we should say this real quick about what what the ginger thing was. Yes. Yeah. People put ginger in their people have ick. They put ginger in their tank, and then the ick goes away, and they say the ick made the ginger go away. That's no, uh, the most. The ginger made the ick go away. Right. And that's the most <laughs> common fallacy ever. But we're not yeah. going to talk about fallacies because no one cares. It's it's just not good reasoning. The reason it's not good reasoning, because the life cycle of ick, as it goes, the spots disappear every three to five to seven days yeah. anyway. Right. So you could do anything and the spots are going to go away. We need yeah. the next step yeah. to know what, you know, to, to look at it. Does it actually do what you think it is? Yeah. And I used to call that hypothesis, but 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 people don't like sciencey words. People really have like a ah hypothesis. Um, so I just call them mind stories now. Mind uh, stories. Mind stories. It's a mind story. So now now show great mind stories are great. That's that's anecdotal, right? I I think this is how things are working. This is what I think. That's great. The next step is finding evidence to show what you think is actually true. Is it actually happening? Um, and that can be a little harder and people freak out at that mm -hmm. and they don't need to. I, you know, the, the, my favorite example of this is when the nano bubbling thing started mm -hmm. um, and people were saying all the claims what nano bubbling was doing. And when I come into something like this, it's the same with the metal halide stuff. Now it's, I'm trying to steel man the argument. Right. So there's straw man and a steel man. Straw man argument is I make the worst possible version of the argument Mark is saying mm -hmm. so I can just knock it over really easily. But yeah. that's not what Mark is saying. Right. It's, it's, it's a terrible, horrible thing to do to straw man somebody. It doesn't help anybody. It makes everyone look stupid. Yeah. Don't do it. Steel man is I am trying to make the best possible version of Mark's argument. And uh, then I want to look at that and see if it holds up. Mm -hmm. And why that is so beautiful 
is because that's really what you're doing. Almost nobody is looking at somebody's claim and just wanting to trash it. Mm -hmm. They're looking at the claim and they're starting to pick at it because they want to know if it's true. Yeah. They don't want to show that it's false. Right. They want to know if it's true. So you steel man it. So my, 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 uh, can I remember what I was going to say, which my favorite example of, of that was, I can't remember now. We'll never know. It was like the cleanest example that would explain. You have like failed us on so many levels. <laughs> so many levels. Wait, let's just take 12 seconds and pretend like the camera's frozen and I'll think about the steel man. <laughs> I've never uh, heard of steel man. I can't remember it. Yeah, well, it's a it's a philosophy thing. Um, Does this help started... jog your memory? Just a bunch of jelly bellies? A bunch of bellies? <laughs> Damn it. It was so good. It didn't good. work. I was sure that was going to work. It was so good. It makes ginger go away. Stop it. <laughs> um, not metal halide. It was something else. Whatever it is, I want to try to build the best even with oh 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 right i remember it was nanobubbles nanobubbles yeah right? you're talking about the micro so, so there was scrubbing. a bunch of a bunch of claims and one of the claims was it raises ph mm -hmm. and i went great great how much did your ph go up when you did this mm -hmm. and the response i got was uh, bleep you jackass it was like wait i don't i don't yeah. understand what happened why are here. you attacking me yeah i just you said the pH goes up. I want to know how much the pH goes up because yeah. I want to I want to know if this is worth doing or not. And this is, and they were like, "Well, I'm not a scientist." And it's like, but you got a pH pen or a pH probe, right? You said you it know, went up. <laughs> you said it went up. And it's like, yeah. well, I just theorized it would go up. And it's like, well, that's not what, what you said. You said it goes up. Yeah. You know the idea of putting bubbles in the tank, and it's like, well, if you start to unpack that, you have to look at how much gas is actually dissolved from the bubble into the water column right. versus how much gas is is exchanged when the surface tension of the water breaks yeah. right <clears throat> and so i would be surprised with what i know about dissolving of gases into water if tiny little bubbles are actually adding much to the water column to affect ph in any significant way yeah but it's like such the simple test it doesn't you don't you don't need you don't need a peer review paper to go. I did this and the pH went up. Yeah, you want to you make that to open your fusion and just look. <laughs> that's a great way to start, and then you go. Yeah. This is what I'm doing with phosphate now and lanthanum. How much is it dropping? It is you. You know, I stop dosing the lanthanum, let the let the phosphate come up, and then do it again. I'll do it yeah. two or three times to see how much it brings it down and how fast. Yeah, before I start going use lanthanum, or I'll go. You know, it worked. You know, it seemed to work for me. I've been telling um, people to use it for like 13 years. So by yeah, the no, way, I'm going to cut you off for one second here because you sure. did post on Facebook. What do you think the phosphate level is of my tank right now? Mm -hmm. And I was really hoping you were setting up for the live stream because the big reveal will be during the live stream of Mila's Reef. <laughs> oh, uh, uh, it is, Mark. That's why I did that. <laughs> That's exactly what I was hoping you were going to say. <laughs> uh, I put a picture of the display tank. Which yeah. is doing really well. Yeah. It's growing. Things are looking really good. Yeah. It wasn't covered um, in hair algae. No hair algae. Uh, no cyano. No diatoms. Right. Uh, you know, just a good looking and reef. The, and the um, and it's stuff is growing. I had to give everything a haircut recently. Yeah. They're almost all healed over in like a week. Nice. Um, and the phosphate. Uh, it Was tested again. It tested Romo. again today. I'll tell you what it is, as of noon today. If this loads, which it is. Because uh, it, it could be a funnier number today than it was. No, uh, 0.97. I was so close. 0.97. I, I guessed 1.3. <laughs> uh, milligrams per liter, right? Yeah. So that's higher than I've been keeping it, but yeah. I haven't been running any lanthanum for a month. Right. Um, yeah, and I only use lanthanum as, as needed, like every 10 to 12 weeks. I don't just use it weekly or something like some yeah. people do. Yeah. I, 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 a guy I know, Adam, you know, on the Reef Beef Discord... I think his is like 7.1. Whoa. Yeah, that made Whoa. me go like that too. And 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 it was like, yeah, I'd lower that. I can't tell you why I'd lower it, but I would cuz yeah. 7 seems like a lot. 
Well, Randy Holmes um, Farley a long time ago warned everyone that once you hit 3.0, that it's now embedded in the rock and the sand. And so even as you remove it, it keeps leaching out and leaching out and leaching out to where it seems like you're not getting rid of the phosphate because it just keeps coming out of the rock. Yeah. And you're also feeding. Yeah. So what I've been doing with the, the daily phosphate testing is noticing, you know, oh, after I feed, it goes up like 0. 0.2. Of course. It'll go 0.5 yeah. Yeah. to 0. 0.7, you right. know. Um, but then it'll kind of drop again over a few days. Yeah. So, so is this an article or is this just a thing for your show or I'm just playing with this right now. You, just I, know. you know, I did, uh, um, we'll see, we'll see because I want to look at the nitrate a little bit more and it might be nice to follow up to the, you know, the original phosphate things I did okay. in like 2015, yeah. but, but it seems pretty clear. My tank is fine at that phosphate level and it's yeah. probably been up there for a month. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Do I recommend that anybody runs their thing like that? No. But do I recommend that people, you know, freak out about phosphate? No. Yeah. Do I recommend that new people care about phosphate at all? Mm -hmm. No. Just like with pH. So you're a new hobbyist. Right. You got other things to worry about than if your pH is, you know, 8.4 as opposed to 8.2. You just, yeah. it just doesn't matter to you. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that kind of thing. All um, right. So what are you testing phosphate with? Just so we all know. Uh, a, 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 a Reef Factory Smart Tester. Hmm. Okay. Um, I'm a little grumpy at Reef Factory, but I think we're all going to have to get over that. Um, but I think what we're going to find from it is, uh, who cares? I mean, I mean, that's what I'm coming to. It's like, oh, okay. Me not having to actually do the test is great because I'm yeah. lazy. Yeah. And, uh, but, you know, my tank... You know, it's the same thing as when I was testing. It looks fine at all these different levels. Fine for me. Yeah. You know, so what do what do what do I care about the phosphate? Um, the nitrate will be interesting too, but I, I also don't see an issue with that. So you know the the you know does 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 nitrate and phosphate make you grow algae? This is a this is another perfect example of what we're talking about, right? Um, when you over fertilize something, algae grows, right? That's what we see in <clears throat> ponds and lakes and stuff like that. Yeah. But there's other, th you know, and we see runoff, right? But there's other things happening. You know, the high phosphate on its own is likely not enough to phase change a healthy reef into mm -hmm. an algae dominated reef. Yeah. You also need to get rid of the herbivores. Mm -hmm. Yes. And when you do that, uh, then you got a problem. Then the right. algae starts to win because algae is so much better at life yeah. than coral. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and it's, this is just like basic marine bioscience. It's if you, <coughs> excuse me, if you fence off an area of wild reef, mm -hmm. so herbivores can't get to it, right. guess what happens? It's going to be covered in algae. Right. Yeah. At reef level nutrients. Yeah. It's not magic. It's true. Right? That's wow. That's such a great point. I'm gonna never forget that. Right. I mentioned you a lot of this show, especially when it comes to algae, because I listened to your talk where you talked about the mouths and you talked about eating. They want to eat the new algae. They don't want the old crusty, yeah. long hair algae that's just doing this in the flow. It's like no, they want the fresh, the best, the tender, the the heart of it. <laughs> right, and that's all anecdote. Yeah, right. Of course, I've not done a study. Yeah. to check preferences of herbivores. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It'd be a great study. Yeah. There's no reason to do it. No one's going to fund it. Right. Uh, some nut hobbyist, looking at you, all of mm -hmm. you out there, yeah, nut hobbyists <laughs> should do nut studies. Yeah. Um, they're great. They're fun. They're interesting. And, sure. and they're helpful. Yeah. Um, but there's lots and lots and lots of anecdote yeah. about the herbivores we keep do not mow down mm -hmm. mostly do not mow down long algae. And if you look to the wild, you see that herbivores get bigger and bigger and bigger. Yeah. And the bigger herbivores, like a bumphead parrotfish, mm -hmm. come and just bites off the whole dead end that has the algae of the coral on it yeah. and eats the whole thing, yeah. which is not what you want in your tank. Right. So, yeah. um, so I think it's important that, you know, uh, there's algae everywhere on wild reefs all Even the time. Even with a low phosphate level. That's such Even a great Even with the point. low phosphate wow. and the low nitrate yeah. level. That makes sense. And why don't you see the algae? Because there's herbivores all over the reef Snacking. all the time. Yeah. All the time. Right. Um, so I, I, I don't, 
I don't really believe at all that, you know, I think high, if you have a lot of fertilizer, right, nitrate and phosphate in your tank, is it possible that that means that the algae could grow faster? Mm -hmm. Sure. How much? Yeah. Who cares? Yeah. Right? I mean, yeah. if, if you've got an algae problem, the speed at which the algae grows is not your problem. Right. The, it's the speed at which it's being removed is yes. the problem. Yeah. Um, and you're not going to lower your levels enough to st to stop the algae from growing because right. algae is really good at life. Yeah. I mean, you can, but then your corals are going to die. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. You're starving the entire system. Yeah. yeah. Right. So, I'm. I. You know. I, I. The idea that we look at the wild ocean, wild reefs, for an idea of what our parameters should be. That's yeah. that's a nice. That's a sound, solid place to start. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. If we don't, we don't know what we're doing. Right. Let's just try to replicate that as best we can. Yeah. As time goes on, we find out what we do care about and what we don't care about. Yeah. Right. And you know, uh, do we care? Do you care that your tank doesn't hit eighty-five in the summer? Right. No. Um, do you care that it doesn't get to seventy-two in the winter? N no. You know, do you care that you have, uh, you know, twelve hours of light? No, because you'll do more light because you want to see your tank. So there's a there's a billion things that we have discovered through the million monkeys, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, if a million monkeys were locked in a room, an infinite number of monkeys, uh, they'd eventually type Shakespeare with typewriters, right? Just really? out of random chance. <laughs> uh, that's, that's the idea. So that's okay. why I say the million monkeys. There's a million of us playing with stuff, and then we talk to each other, and that yeah. worked, that worked. And it's much slower incremental progress than... Mm -hmm you know, more focused studies, but it, but we know a lot of stuff that we didn't know before. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think the phosphate and nitrate control for algae came from the initial mind story that this is what it does. Mm -hmm. I mean, sure it does because in some, we, we see, we see in this paper, it says that the phosphate and the nitrate was up. Yeah. It's like, but also in that paper, it says, that herbivory was down and there were no herbivores and all the diadema died off in this area. And, yeah. you know, and it's also runoff from agriculture. So there's mm -hmm. also silt in the water. There's all kinds of things happening. Yeah. I mean, that's uh, the point, you know, like you were just saying before, okay, I'm putting food in, but if your cleanup crew dies or you have fish that get consumed and die because they were caught by a carpet anemone, they're also adding to the nutrients, right? I mean, these are just things that are going to happen in the tank that you may not really think about. You you had a hundred snails, now you got seven. That means there's 93 dead snails in the ecosystem and doing a water change won't take out all the, not necessarily, let's say toxins, but you know it raised ammonia briefly, which did cycle into nitrite, nitrate. And so you've got a nitrate rise. And then because of the die off, you have a phosphate rise. And so these numbers are going up also from those things as well. Or if you well, have hermit crabs that kill snails. I, I think more importantly, um, you have fewer herbivores to eat the algae. Yeah. So I, I think that's true. I think a, a little, I, I, I can't say that more fertilizer in the water is not going to help algae to grow. Mm -hmm. But I think the amount at which we attribute algae growing faster because mm -hmm. of nutrients is, is, is quite overblown. Okay. Uh, I, I think it's, I can see it, that. it is herb, herbivory. Um, you know, and that's not even critical thinking because all we're doing is saying, well, the ocean has low numbers and yet it's growing algae in abundance. <laughs> I mean, right. that's just like, really, that's just like, my mind is just blown. It's like, yeah, that but, totally makes sense. Right. But the mind story is I don't, there's no algae, there's no algae in the, in the wild. Yeah. I don't see any, you know, on this reef, I didn't see any algae. There's tons. You know? Who says you that? Know? And then in the talk, in the talk, I talk about those jackass damsels okay. that, yeah scare all the herbivores away and, the, yes. and they farm the algae and there's yeah. algae all over there where there's yeah. no herbivores right you go over to this reef where there's herbivores there's no algae it's gotcha. it's, it's pretty it's pretty compelling evidence yeah without me being able to show you a paper that proves yeah that that's the case um and then also the other part of this which i think is important is you have to look at all the reports mm -hmm. right so when people report that and there are people who report that they lowered their nutrient levels and their algae issues uh, went away, right? Yep. 
that's that's great evidence. That's yeah. that's wonderful. I want to hear magic that. Magic right there. <laughs> what what makes it less compelling? I don't know if it's magic. Some people, some people I take seriously tell me this. Yeah. On the other on the other hand, there are a billion people who say I lowered the nutrients and my algae is still growing out of control. Yep. So that tells me there's something amiss in the thinking. Yeah. That. And, and, you know, we do that with everything, but this, the, we, we like the idea of nutrients for algae is because we can control, now we can control nitrate and phosphate. Yeah. When we couldn't control phosphate, we didn't care about phosphate, <laughs> right? Yeah. So there. All right. So that's nutrients. Let's talk about critical thinking about flow. That's going to, we're going to hit all four of your topics today. About flow? About flow. Yeah. So what's the critical thinking on flow these days, according to Richard Ross? master of the universe and all things flow <laughs> when i when i was toying with a, a master's and a phd one of the things i was going to look at was flow mm -hmm. and how it relates to growth of newly settled coral mm -hmm. acropora uh it turns out measuring flow is hard yeah. uh linear flow, <laughs> linear flow you make a box and you can measure what's going on there. Right. Chaotic flow, really, it's it's just not straightforward. Right. Uh, and I was looking at like getting a grant to get a lot of these tiny little machines to try to do it. Yeah. Um, so, <clears throat> what do I think we know about flow? Is maybe the a better answer. Mm -hmm. uh, we know that these animals need flow for respiration, mm -hmm. for to eat and uh, to get rid of waste. Yes. Right? Yep. So we know we need flow. Uh, how much flow do we need? Well, I don't know what the answer to that is. I mm -hmm. think I think we need more flow than we think. Uh, I think people who go out and scuba dive on reefs uh, often think that they're, that's what the flow is like, mm -hmm. uh, and that's what the flow they should be putting in their tank. But hmm. you're diving on that reef because there's because it's calm. Yes, you know, exactly. <laughs> go, go do a drift dive and you'll yeah. see what the flow is like or get yeah. stuck at the tidal change on the reef flat. Yeah. And that's pretty scary when you when you're going, wow, I'm walking like a foot a minute against yeah. this flow. Maybe it's time just to get washed out to sea. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I can only tell you what I do. I, I think I, I look to the ocean again. You know what happens? And, and that is that there are. Uh, tidal changes over the course of the day, right? It changes mm -hmm. roughly four times a day. You know, the water comes in from one direction, then it hangs out for a little while mm -hmm. as as it turns around, then it flows out the other direction, right? Mm -hmm. And that kind of happens twice a day. So in my tank, that gives you four. Incoming tide, slack yeah. tide, outgoing tide, slack tide, right? And okay. that repeats. I was wondering what number four was. All right. Um, it's the same thing. So I've got my tank that kind of pushes from one side most of the, you know, for a few hours. And then it kind of slacks. And then it kind of pushes everywhere for tip, for a little while. Mm -hmm. Then it pushes the other direction for a little while. So I think, I think, and this is based on my butt, you know, this is totally anecdote um, based on what I see in the wild. This is all a thought experiment yeah. That seems to be working for me, but I would never tell anyone to do this. Mm -hmm. uh, I like the flow to change over the course of the day. Mm -hmm. uh, I like there to be calm periods and I like there to be intense periods. Yeah. And I like it to change direction. And that means everything gets gets flow. Yeah. If it's all pushing one way, it's harder to get rid of dead spots. And the flow doesn't just pound all the time. Right. It changes. Right. Yeah. There, there, there's a, a spot in Plow German Channel where, you know, if you time it wrong, you're just shooting through that channel. Yeah. You, you're not really seeing anything. Whee! Right? Um, and there's other times that you go and you have to swim the whole way because, yeah. the you know, and then the flow turns around and sucks you out the other direction. So yeah. that that's what I think about flow. I think flow should vary throughout the day uh, because that's what happens on a wild reef. Mm -hmm. And uh, my mind story around that. Uh, makes a lot of sense to me that that uh, I have no problem with the word hypothesis. I, I'm fine with that one. That's scary scientific word. It's OK, yeah, man. It's sort of like people using the word unalive. I'm like, why do they keep saying this? Oh, no, that was worried about algorithms. Dead. Like oh, everybody knows what dead means. So uh -huh. just say dead. Uh, but um, 
people people really get turned off with uh, too many scientific terms. So I I, I, I try not I to do like it. Because some I, are okay, but I, I I'd rather mean. I'd rather make it make have it make sense to people than yeah. than have people react like well screw you. I, I you know. Yeah. Um, so my mind story about flow is that, and uh, it's what I see on yep. all the wild reefs I've dove, mm -hmm. um, and it makes a lot of sense to me, and so that's what I like to do. My reef is actually set to four different modes, actually, throughout the 24-hour period. I, I just kind of picked it. I didn't even really have a, a, a basis like you just described. It was like, I want the morning to be this. I want the day to be more. I, I want the... The evening to be at uh, increased, you know, uh, waste removal process, and then I want lagoon mode during feeding. You know, I want to just kind of slow, slow. I want food to move, but I don't want to like shoot through the tank because I want the fish to get it, not to have to chase it down. Sure, you even know? though it's fine for them to chase it, it's <clears throat> you know, and the idea of you know laminar flow, flow going one direction for a while. I yeah. like that idea, and I think right. that happens. So a couple <laughs> hours of that is good. Yeah, but you know, if you when you go to wild reefs, you know I've been lucky enough to be on a lot of them, and yeah. I can snorkel them in the morning and see what's going on before yeah. anyone gets up. Right. And in the morning, when it's calmer, before the tide is flipped around or before the wind has come up, yeah. Um, boy, herbivores are out eating a whole lot. Yeah. You know, because yeah, easier. Uh, it's easier. <laughs> and at the academy, in the two hundred twelve thousand gallon tank, I would see the same thing early morning. You know, I ended up setting the flow to be low in the morning mm -hmm. and they were out there, you know, hitting all the nooks and crannies yeah. uh, a lot easier. So, you know, I, and I'm totally happy if someone comes back with some other evidence that's compelling that goes, nope, it should be on. You should be on 100 percent one direction all the time. I'm when totally you do, open to that. When you do the coral spawning and you catch the eggs that are fertilized and you put them in a settling tank with all the discs, what kind of flow do you put in there? Yeah. Yeah, that's a that's a that's a hard one. Uh, once they've settled, um, yeah, once they're holding. But I mean, they're drifting. So how do you how do well, you when they're drifting? What do they do in the ocean? <laughs> how do well, they grab onto something if the flow is so crazy intense? Because well, the, they they spawn the, at night. The flow. Well, then they go sit up, right? Then the the embryos float at the surface for a couple of days, uh -huh. and then they start searching. Um, you know, but there's different flows and they swim and most of them don't survive. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We like to joke that, you know, 99% at each stage don't make it. Yeah. Um, which is really depressing. Yeah. It's uh, crazy. When you have a billion settlers and then a month later you don't. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I'm doing weird stuff here to try to figure out how to make it easier. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a multi-year project. So, um, this whole thing that I built behind me here, that's going away from what I learned from it. I've got to rebuild it and do it a different way. Uh, and we'll see what happens. Hmm. Uh, but I am probably, to answer your question a sideways way, yeah. I'm probably moving to all air okay. uh, water motion Which in with the babies. Kind of like <clears throat> this. Well, I'm going to put air on this side mm -hmm. and air on this side on the mm -hmm. two different sides of the tank yep. and have the controller turn this one on okay. and this one on so I can make the water go this way. Right. I can make the water go this way sure. and I can make the water do both ways. Which is what I was describing. Yeah. So th I'm going to do that. To kind of force them down onto the, to get them closer to the disc to grab on. That's what I'm thinking. No, no, no. When they're settling, there's very little flow. Okay. I just want them to be able to find out where they're going to go. There needs to, I, there probably needs to be some to keep them, doing it but not not that much they'll okay. settle in a, in a petri dish okay but right. I, i'm moving i'm moving to all i have um some jabo gyres in here this year yeah. that i use to bounce the incubators okay um but once i've settled the babies i'm going to take those out and go to air again because of co-culturing with baby urchins and baby mm -hmm. snails those go into a pump and then you know into a gyre and then they get chopped up they get destroyed uh, and i don't want to do that i think right. jamie actually pointed that out to me and i went oh yeah because i'm not i'm not running urchins as as intensely as he as they are so right yeah so just there. to bring it up to speed in case some of you are hearing rich and not knowing what he's talking about he had a really tight close-up of a tiny baby coral polyp that was on a huge disc i mean it was a dot of life on a huge frag plug which we know is only this big and he was actively scraping away coralline algae because the coralline was trying to cover the speck of DNA that was going to be an SPS coral one day. 
Yeah. Your tank's a war zone. And at the microscopic level, it's even worse. I just learned that recently. I, I picked up a microscope. And I did some video of some sand uh, and some waste in Caitlin's Reef trying to figure out what I've got. And uh, disgusting stuff. It's like, don't want to suck on the end of a tube ever again. <laughs> Take a take a small rock or a frag plug that's been in there for a while yeah. and look at what's on that. Uh, see, I'm literally like coming up with lists of things I want to look at now under the microscope because I didn't have a master plan other than like find out what kind of dino this is. That's all I cared about. But like I've had, you know, I thought carbon. I'd like to look at a carbon green. Oh, yeah, that's uh, interesting. I'd like to look at phytoplankton <laughs> and I have some easy reef phytogel. So I'm going to uh -huh. mix that gel with a little bit of water and then I'm going to take a sample of that water and stick it under there. And now you're saying to take a frag plug and look at that. Yeah, or, or a piece if there's of enough rock. room. I'd like that idea. Yeah. Hmm. Cut, the, cut the stem off the frag plug of so it's, it's flatter. Yeah. Um, and or, also or put the frag plug right where the light is. <laughs> um, side light's also your friend. Yeah, of course. In the microscope. Well, so now I got the can... super light. I'm set. I, I just oh yeah, <laughs> you can put the super light on the side. You, 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 everything looks different from a side light than from a top light. You see all kinds of details you never would have considered before. Now you've used microscopes a lot in your life, right? Yeah. So when I used mine, I pretty much used it for twenty minutes, and yeah. then after that, I couldn't see out of my eye. It, like there was like yeah. this cloud. Is there a way to avoid the cloud? No. <laughs> I was like, I was giving myself glaucoma. I was like, way to go, Mark. And like for the rest of the day, I was like, geez, there's like this dot in the middle of my vision on my right eye. It's like, ah. There's two things I can say is make sure you're comfortable, yeah. right? If you're hunched over, yeah. you're going to have a bad time with your microscope. <laughs> and I got one of these. I think I can just show it to you. I'm glad you wore pants. <laughs> Me too. Can you see this? Hang on, I'll, I'll make it wider. Let's see, Richard Ross. There. It, it came over here, but nice. I spilled water everywhere. I need, ah. a, I need a towel. But the towel's right, right there. Just take a second. All right, Sorry. so since he walked away, I'll just go right here and take over yeah. for a second. <laughs> yeah. I'm kidding. Let's watch Rich uh, mop up the floor. This is how scientists do it. Yeah, scientists, don't, don't leave... Things He's using water. his foot, people. This is a this is a the top of the Dunning Kruger effect. This is but when you know, know use your foot. Okay. <laughs> Good job. Uh, so this thing here. Yeah, it's a huge this, screen. This is two hundred and thirty bucks. Okay. It's a sol a, sol a soldering a soldering microscope. I can't say soldering. Sol solder solder. <laughs> Solar microscope. Solder soldering soldering. Oh. Okay. Um. And so you can, it's got a lot of space yeah. and the screen lights up. So I can, I'm just looking at stuff like this yeah, now. Right. Instead you of have like a huge this. screen. It's not a digital magnifier. It's just a way to see really well. Yeah. It's, it's a, I mean, it's a full microscope that yeah. just goes right into there. That's pretty nice. Yeah. I think they're great. It's changed. Uh, it's, it's certainly made all the work doing on baby corals uh, easier. Yeah, I bet. All right. Uh, okay. So we talked about flow. Let's talk about lighting. You yeah. mentioned, you alluded to it earlier when you said you don't want just 12 hours. You want more. I'm like, no, I disagree. Nine hours. That's plenty. Yeah. And everyone, like, but people want more. It's like, no, you get nine. That's it. That's all you get. You get nine. <laughs> it depends on what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Tank is for you. If you, if you want to see the coral late at night, you should see the coral late at night. Yeah. You well, then I just say light. shift your schedule later. You don't need to light up the tank in the morning then. Yeah, Start well, at one in the afternoon. I mean, get the nine you don't hours. want to. You don't want to do twenty four hours of light. But right. if you want to do 14, 15 hours of light, your your corals are probably just fine. No, it's terrible you know, advice. It's, don't listen to Rich. Just, He's wrong. Let me yeah, let me no, get him no, off of here. Let's see. Don't. Doing. I'm doing. I'm, yeah. How do I mute this guy again? <laughs> also, also, my light, you know, ramps up in the morning and ramps down in the evening. Yes, that's true. So. Yeah, having dimmer light during the then you know to have it longer for a couple hours. That's not going to affect the corals too much. Let me ask you, when you're doing your spawning of corals, though, your does your lighting schedule matter, or is it just your moon schedule that matters, or yeah. does all of it matter? It's it's uh, it's when it's coming up to spawning time, the yeah. moon schedule is critical. Okay, two or three months. Mm -hmm. um, but your 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 sunrise and sunset is also pretty critical there, because it's probably yeah. 
the difference some somehow the difference between the darkness between sunset and moonrise yeah. right. that is doing the trigger ah, now that's it, interesting probably yeah um um now in our systems that's not really what's happening right you know because we don't do wild, that we just in switch the wild, straight to the moon yeah. no well in the wild you know they spawn like four or five days after the full moon generally yes. right pretty reliably for for me they're going you know 12 15 days after mm -hmm. the full moon and at that point the controller is you know, what the moon is doing has really got nothing to do with what the moon actually does so uh, the, the the controller is not really is 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 not really mimicking what the actual moon does okay it's, it's mimicking kind of like a stylized version of the moon all right and and also by the time i reach day 15 you know it's certainly not doing what it was doing on day four after the full moon mm -hmm. right so i'm getting a spawn when you know the moon rises until like four in the morning mm -hmm. uh whereas 10 days before that it was at you know 9 15 or whatever right yeah yeah uh, so we don't really know what's going on but well, that makes really... me wonder about this. I just this weird thought just jumped into my brain that we okay. So I know I've heard this since I was a kid that the moon is why our oceans have ripples and that we have waves. That the moon causes this. That it causes the tides. Is that true yeah. or is that false? That's kind of true. Okay, so if it does the... it in a, it does it in a weird way. Okay, good enough. That's fine. That means yeah. I'm still winning this argument. Okay, keep going. So <laughs> so if the moon is traveling, and it's not in a perfect circle either, right? It's kind of doing this elliptical thing a little bit around the planet, yeah. or is it exactly perfect all the time? Uh, it's not perfect, but I... That's what I thought. It's slightly we're, off. We're, okay. We're, so, it, we're into things that I don't know enough about to speak with confidence. No, no, that's fine. That's fine, too, because I don't know anything. But I'm thinking, what if... Because the moon's kind of elliptical around the Earth, and you said it doesn't spawn on full moon doesn't spawn a new moon it's like four days off to 15 days off so it makes me think as the moon gets to a certain distance away it magnetizes the eggs out of the body of the coral and sends them loose into the ocean because it's that close to the planet just like it pulls the waves it's pulling the spawn that seems correct to me uh, <laughs> thank you <laughs> i'm gonna get rid of everything and just let the it's just the magnetate the magnetizing of the moon that's, that's doing right. it. I want the moon's <laughs> magnetic magnetic attraction to yeah. pull. As it gets closer, it can pull it, but as it gets further away, it's right. it's, it's older. Right. It's, it's there, as it can't do it. It's got to wait for the next pass. Gametes, coral gametes are magnetic. Right. Um, There's metal in them, right? There's iron. Oh my god! No! <laughs> no! No! Ginger. <laughs> <laughs> Nah, I knew that was stupid. <laughs> yeah. I was just thinking people. there is a distance factor, though, to keep in mind. I mean, my mom always said, you know, when there's a full moon, people are crazy. And it seems to be kind of true. <laughs> people do seem to get a little wacky around full moon. You live in California, so you should totally understand this. You live in Texas. I think it's worse. Um, ah! People always want to say that it's the gravity that's affecting the spawn. Uh. And it's like, no, because we can make, because, because they don't spawn in sync with the real moon anyway mm -hmm. uh in our tanks so yeah. no okay All also right. you can you can shift it to make it happen whenever okay you so want. that totally wipes out my my your magnetic uh your Too magnetic bad. i was like man the moon just passing just close i was like <laughs> it just happens uh, i encourage everyone to look up uh, <laughs> how the moon actually causes tides because mm -hmm. it's actually really interesting and i'll screw it up if i tell it to you All right. but it's it's got to do with the the distance uh, with the diameter of the Earth, actually, has a, a lot to do with it. I wrote it down so I won't forget because I will look that up because yeah. I've always a heard couple, the moon makes the ocean move. <laughs> there's a couple of great, great videos in there uh, around that talk about it. Okay, great. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Amanda Meckley says, Ginger! Coral spawn due to Ginger! Absolutely. You heard it secret. here from Richard Ross. <laughs> that's the secret no one's telling you. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in, guys. That's our show. <laughs> Let's end on a high note. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's talk about let's, trace elements. What do you want to know about uh, trace elements? Trace elements. Critical thinking of trace elements. Not yet, Jackie. I know you want to go. Not yet. 
Yeah, it's it's the same thing as everything else. It's um, you know, um, natural saltwater values on reefs are good. A good in the in the amount of uh, in the absence of anything else, that's a fine place to try to hit. Yeah. Um, you know, but you know, what does uh, what do the levels matter? Right. When ICP started, one of the things that we found out in um, United States tanks is that there was a lot of lithium in the water mm-hmm. and people were freaking out. And it's like, well, before the ICP test, we had a lot of lithium in the water and none of us cared and everything mm-hmm. was fine. Yeah. And now there's a lot of now that we know that there's a lot of lithium in the water. Why do we care at all? And how do we get lithium out of the water? We don't. And how did we have tank of the months back then when we had all that lithium in our water? Right. And we still have all that lithium. In the- so so while it's a good natural saltwater valleys are a great place to start, we mm. need to kind of see what the realities. It's got to move from a mine story right. to a practical story. And, um, you know, the, the trace elements are harder. Uh, because they're harder to measure in a in, in, with a plus or minus that we can trust. Right. Um, there may or may not be an article coming out about that soon. By you? Um, I'm not saying anything else. Um, By someone that has Ross in their last name? Uh, maybe. Maybe. It could be my my daughter who's got my shoes. That's why I have no shoes on. I just saw people are laughing. <laughs> she has your shoes. <laughs> um, shoes are overrated, Elaine Sinclair. Um, so... I, my my thing is I will, I'll hedge it. I want to I want to add some trace elements to the tank, right? Mm-hmm. I want yep. there to be some. Um, but I'm not going to kill myself trying to match any value from any tests because I have to squint at the tests at the levels that they're reporting back mm-hmm. and uh, how they're how like an ICP test is doing that. I, mm-hmm. Um. I want to know what the plus minus. We generally don't know what the plus minus. The new article might shed some some light on that. Mm-hmm. But the, it's the same thing as forever that we know. It's we don't know how accurate these are. So if you're if you're like if you're trying to change your calcium, calcium. This is a great way to do it, right? Calcium is great. There's a lot of it in the water. Yep. So the plus minus can be bigger because we mm-hmm. don't care as much, right? Right. Yeah. And we also know through the million monkeys and anecdote and 40, 50 years of reef keeping that if you get a test back, if you test your testing, you mm-hmm. test it yourself, you know what the plus minus is plus some more, right? The plus minus on your test kit is if you've done everything right, yes, you can expect a 5% difference. Yes. Right. <clears throat> but you yeah. Most not, people don't think about that. But even if you've not done everything right, maybe you've done a 15% difference. Yeah. With calcium, you don't actually care. Yeah. If you get a calcium result back that's 440, it could be 380, it could be 500. You don't. If you're yeah. going to chase that number, um, I, I want to have a drink with you and talk about your life choices, um, <laughs> because we know that those phosph- that 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 calcium in there doesn't matter. Yeah. Now, if you're looking at something like nickel, much smaller amount, right? A 50% or 20% plus or minus makes more of a difference. Sure. So, and because we don't really know what nickel is doing, you know, Mm -hmm. there's bunches of people who have elevated nickel, their tanks are fine. Mm -hmm. Um, So if you're adding nickel, you know, if you're, do you add too much nickel? if, If you're not sure how accurate your results are, tweaking it down to the tiny levels, you're, you you, you're really throwing bones out there. You're throwing mm-hmm. knuckle bones because you can't really know what the results are. So now, you're talking about elevated, but most often trace elements are lacking. Yeah. There's not enough because they were depleted by the system basically, right? Because the yeah. took it in, the plants took it in. So you're putting in more to replace what's missing. Yeah. So I use um, ESV's um, uh, TE plus. Okay. Trace elements plus. Yep. Um, um, they don't pay me to say that. I just like the product. Um, and I like the product cause I like, it's got a bunch of stuff in it yep. and I just dose some of it. Yeah. I'm just adding some of it. I'm not trying to you don't have a number. maximize the dose. I just want there to be some of these available. Right. That that's how I'm handling that. When it comes to and, dosing and trace elements, I put in this many, that many, and it's every cheap day. And easy. 
cheap and easy is what I'm looking at. If it's expensive and hard, yeah. I don't want to do it. It's pain. Right. Yeah. Right. If I yeah, have to I do agree. 50 trace elements, I don't care. So, yeah. you know, I'm just hitting, you know, until somebody shows me, yeah. you know, that fluoride adding fluorine to my system actually has an effect yeah. better than it looks better. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, <laughs> which is the I'm ultimate not. judge of all things. Does I've it look with, better? You know, I played with so many things because people said it made it look better and I wanted yeah. to see it for myself. Right. And I, you know, they don't make it look better or they do, mm -hmm. but that's, that's also, you know, a, a sunk cost or, you know, uh, uh, because I did it, I, I'm looking for it and I want yeah. it to be true. Yeah. Um, well, Rich, I can, I can answer that one. Um, with some, you know, you can call it anecdotes or whatever you, anecdotes. 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 <laughs> Uh, when my tank went to crap because of the potassium that, you know, collapsed and I just had none, I um, ended up, you know, fixing the problem by just putting in potassium. That's what I did. And it made, and then 12 weeks later, the tank looked better. Yeah. But then I got into the whole, I'm going to test ICP and I was testing it weekly and I was dosing based on those numbers with all these different specific trace elements. I had, I had like seven bottles and I wanted vanadium and I wanted cesium and I wanted... You know, just these, the ones that were lacking. And I focused really hard and it cost me a fortune. You know, it was $40 a test, you know, per week for 12 weeks and, or eight, at, at least eight. I think it was 12 though. And my tank was glowing. I, finally, the corals looked like you see them on Facebook. <laughs> you know, when you see those pictures, cause I remember I, I actually got kind of offended. I'd see these fantastic pictures from vendors and I'm not putting the vendors down. I'm just saying I saw them. And then I'd see some hobbyists who had a really pretty reef tank. And I'm like, God, their tank looks so pretty. Why wasn't, why doesn't my tank look that pretty? And then when I was dosing all these trace elements and I was really on top of the testing, like crazy methodically expensively, my tank actually was starting to match those standards. And I was like, huh? So it's not an Instagram filter. <laughs> it is possible to get the right combination of all these little minor elements. And of course, take care of the major ones as well. And you can actually get these colors, but it's, it doesn't, it comes at a price. It is harder yeah and, and and how much is the juice worth to squeeze yeah right so now yeah. you're not doing that right or you're right. still doing it no i'm not doing it and my tank doesn't look nearly as nice it's like i literally can see the befores and afters you know it's like i backed off of it definitely see a difference like huh it really yeah. did affect the way the tank looked yeah. so technically yeah you i want the juice <laughs> i need to squeeze more <laughs> well then then go ahead and squeeze more i think yeah. most people don't care yeah I mean, well, I just both... you either get tired, you get worn out, or you you know you run out of money and you you financially can't keep up with it. There's yeah. that, you know. So I'll I'll tell you this, I see my tank sometimes look bomber like that, mm -hmm. and sometimes not, mm -hmm. and I don't do that with trace elements. Yeah. So, you know, I don't know. I am doing something weird with like uh, potassium hydroxide and potassium chloride. Mm. Maybe that's it. Or, you know, maybe it looks really good now because I've gone on a war with the acro-eating flatworms. And, uh -huh. and even yeah. at a low level of infestation, um, it makes the corals not look Right, because as... it's sucking the coral the color right out of them. <laughs> it's, chomp, yeah, chomp, makes, chomp. just a little bit of chomping maybe makes them yeah. not look as fit. Right. I don't know. Yeah. Um, but, but, yeah, I'm not... I, I can't see the utility in doing all that work right? Uh, when I don't really know what's the culprit. You yeah. know, you said vanadium. And as far as we know, vanadium is only used by tunicates. So I'm not, you know, it's not, it's, you know, and rubidium is not bioactive at all. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I'm not sure why people are dosing those. Um, you know, and like I said before with the other stuff, I am happy to be, to change my mind on that given, given compelling evidence. Yeah, I'm trying to look at what I was dosing. You know, just pulled it up really quick. So I was putting in manganese. I was putting in vanadium. I was putting in cobalt. Um, I'm this went on for a long time, uh, and then something called MT, which is minor trace, I think. And yeah. it's it's a combina combo bottle of like several things. That was kind of like my core starting point. And then of course I use my Prodevio every 15 days too, which throws another. Uh, thing into the equation which right. is iodine and strontium so how do you make this more than a mind story right that's that's the thing 
Yeah. And people go, I'm not going to do a scientific test. And it's like, no yeah. one's asking you to do a scientific yeah. test. But what you can do is be methodical. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You can take, a, take your baseline picture, make a note of how you did that picture and what your lighting was and what yep. time of day it was. Yeah. That's how you're always going to take this picture. Right. Right? And then you start dosing. Right. And then you start taking those pictures. Yep. And then you make notes when you think that you see a difference. Yes. And then you look at the pictures and see if you actually see a difference. Yeah, and then do you they spread, look different? Yeah. And then you bring that to somebody else yeah. and let them look at it. Yeah. And then if, yeah, if everyone agrees there's a difference, it's like, okay, now you, Reefer B. Exactly, you, you do it. You do the same thing. Exactly. You know, and you do that two or three times. Right. Then you have a compelling case. Yeah. Now, it gets harder if you're adding a bunch of stuff. Yes. Because it could be any of those things. So then right. you've got to do it where you parse those out. Yeah. Right. You do them one at a time, and does yeah. that make the difference? Yeah, yeah, it's true. So, yeah. So there you go. That's <laughs> what I think. All so, right. Yeah. That was good. Thanks, Rich. Okay. Is there you any other critical thinking you want to talk about today? I feel like you probably had thousands more. You were so excited. It, 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 it's it's how 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 far you want to go down the rabbit hole with it, you know. And and the the skeptical reef keeping articles are still there. Mm -hmm. You can get through them through. Uh, I think there's a link on the reefbeatpodcast.com. Mm -hmm. Or, or you can still see them on reefs.com from Reefs Magazine. Mm -hmm. Or you can see them on my website, uh, packedhead.net. Mm -hmm. So those articles are there. And they're, I, I, I may redo them just for fun, mm -hmm. you know, just update them. But there may not be a reason. They're just saying it's the same thing. Um, so I just think be careful and, you know, uh, um, ask yourself why you believe whatever it is you're saying. Yeah. And if you don't have a good reason, say it with a little bit more care instead yeah. of, uh, you know, dogmatically. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, all, I, we're all I, just trying to get through this together and we're all relying on each other for information. Yeah. And so the more methodical you can be, mm -hmm. I'm not saying scientific, right. methodical, because all of all a paper is, is writing down what you did. Mm -hmm. And so, then... And Enough information that, like you just said, that the next person can literally do what you did and see if they can recreate the same experiment. Right. Right. That, that, that's a great step. But your yeah. first step is, I think I saw something. How do I document that in a way that is useful to other people? Yeah. It made it look better. Everybody has said that about, every, you know, uh, the eco aqualizer made things right. look better for people. Yeah. And that, that was clearly not a real product. Right. Um, I mean, it was a real product, but it didn't do anything. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think, I think don't be scared people. It's, it's not that hard. Um, you know, and, and when somebody says that's an interesting claim, how do you support it? Mm -hmm. Your answer should be, this is how I support it. Or, right. Oh, I really don't have anything to support it. <laughs> not screw you for asking because yes. uh, no one's trying to trap you. Yeah. If you if you have come up with the magic thing that's yeah. going to make all our lives easier, right. we all want it. Yeah, uh, I just want compelling evidence to to believe it. Yeah, no, I agree. And uh, I tend to, I don't know I, people don't say that to me when I ask a question, Rich. It must be your personality. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. What because do you say? Like, <laughs> how do you support that claim? That always seems like such an attack to some people, and to me, it just never seems like an attack. It's yeah. oh. This is how I support the claim. Right. Yeah. Um, which is why I was talking about evidence and, and, you know, we don't want proof. We want evidence and everything is evidence. Yeah. Some evidence is more compelling than other evidence, but yeah. it's all useful. Yeah. And especially it's useful because you can look at it yourself and go, if somebody told this to me mm -hmm. about something I don't already believe, yeah. would their evidence compel me to think what they were saying was true? Uh, let me throw this out there, Rich, just out of curiosity. I don't know if you felt the same way. Um, I had to do a series of interviews with uh, manufacturers for this issue of Coral Magazine. And each interview was two hours long. And I noticed the same thing with Chris Meckley when we talked about Kalkwasser. We were on for two hours. Something happens to my brain after two hours. I start to think maybe they're right. <laughs> I don't know what the hell is going on. It's like you have your defenses up for a while and then you start to listen and then you're like, huh. Maybe I should consider this, so, you know? So I'll, <laughs> Do you I'll, feel I'll, that way by any chance with long conversations or is it just absolutely me? Absolutely not. 
In fact, I feel the opposite. If it goes on for a long time, something's wrong. Okay. You know, at, 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 at scientific conferences, and mm -hmm. we're going to talk about, you know, uh, um, you talk for 10 or 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. You don't talk for an hour like, like we're used to in the hobby. Yeah. You, you should be able to get across what you think is happening mm -hmm. and the evidence you have that supports the idea of what you think is happening yeah. pretty quickly and pretty easily. Okay. Um, then you can go down rabbit holes all you want. Sure. Right. But if, if we're talking for a long time just to convince you mm -hmm. that something's off there to me, okay. not always, but that's going to make me go. And that's also a tactic that con people use. Yeah. Yeah. Like you the timeshares. <laughs> that's right. They're yeah. going to put you in a room and talk to you for two hours. Yeah. And you're going to start to believe them because you just want them to stop. <laughs> I think that um, might be and, it. I don't know. <laughs> and because the human brain just gets pounded on. Right. Yeah. So I keep going. I would keep going. What's the actual evidence you're presenting? Yeah. Is that is that you're just saying that? Yeah. And that that's a nice thing to say. Yeah. But how are you supporting that? Yeah. Exactly. And, and again, this is not just try to screw anybody mm -hmm. or make anybody look stupid. I don't care about that. I yeah. only care about how I look, mm -hmm. um, which is why I don't wear shoes. <laughs> um, but but, you know, I can tell you what any of the articles I wrote, even like the even like the scientifical kind of articles, mm -hmm. I can tell you in two sentences really what it's about. Um, and then I can tell you a paragraph and then I can tell you mm -hmm. five minutes and then here's the paper or the article. Yeah. Um, and that's, I think how it should be. And I took, mm -hmm. you know, it's not like it hasn't, you know, happened to me, the, the phosphate thing in 2014, mm -hmm. I got a lot of pushback, mm -hmm. you know, the, the ICP paper got a lot of pushback, which <clears throat> at the end it was like, well, no, it's really actually, this is pretty good for mm -hmm. ICP. Um, it's just, it's just setting the reality. Yeah. So I, I like to ask like the new paper I just wrote, some of the people that were reading it for me, mm -hmm. um, I said, can you sum, sum up this paper in English in a paragraph for me? What mm -hmm. did you take away in English? Mm -hmm. And then that was really helpful to me. I was like, okay, great. That's, yeah. that's actually what I was hoping, you know, or, yeah. it, or if it's not, I've got to tweak it a little bit to, to make it say the way I want it to. So I, yeah, the, if you get browbeaten with stuff, you're just hearing it over and over and that gets dangerous, right? Mm -hmm. Because a complete <laughs> lie or a complete untruth, if, if it turns out, if, if, if you get on your show mm -hmm. and every time you're on the show, you talk about how something's not true, mm -hmm. that adding, adding soda, adding Coca-Cola to your aquarium, mm -hmm. uh, is, is bad for your aquarium. Right. Even if you say it like that, yeah. at some point people go and a year later, somebody goes, what about adding Coke? They go, well, I saw there was something about adding Coke to your aquarium. So it's probably yeah. okay. It, it all just gets flipped around in your head yeah. if you hear it for long enough. Got so it. you you have to be you have to be a little bit on top of your own mind mm -hmm. and, and challenging yourself about why do I believe this? First you want to go how important it is that I believe this right. or not. You yeah, know, yeah, why yeah. You know, why we're arguing over lithium. Yeah. Right. You know, only 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 the nuts should be yeah. talking about lithium in the tanks. And they should be talking about mm -hmm. it because that's great. Yeah. But you know, well, even if I mentally kind of start to go down this thought of hmm, maybe they're right, there's this other thing that just kind of squashes it, which is great. It's just built into me. It's like my tank looks fine. And if my right. tank looks fine, why do I need to add this whatever it is you're talking about? Right. I mean, and if I have a lacking, if I have a problem and that thing will fix my problem, yeah, I'm more interested than if I have a perfectly functioning reef. Why would I suddenly start adding caulkwas or everything's already growing too fast? Right. You know? Uh, I see a quote, a question I want to, I want to, I want to address. Mm -hmm. uh, some things are more complicated and take more than 15 minutes. I said that. Yeah. You should be able to explain it at several different levels. The initial level that makes me think, should I even listen to you at all about this? Yeah. The second level here is actually what I'm kind of seeing. Mm -hmm. Here's a little bit more for you to understand. Yeah. The third level is here's our 10 minute conversation about it. Yeah. I, I can't think of. 
and, and then at some point you, you you might be able to say, now we've reached the edge of our understanding. And I think I, I have done a PhD in this and you have not. And so anything that we talk now is we're just talking to talk. Mm -hmm. So, um, man, you, you, you should be able to, you should be able to get your point across in different ways. Mm -hmm. If, if you want people to listen to it, yeah. because otherwise if, 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 if you go to somebody and go, yeah, I need to talk to you for two hours about how long a trace element is good for your tank. That's just, I've got nothing that makes me think I should do that conversation, spend two hours of my life. Um, I, I can't think of a single paper I've written where I can't sum it up for you in, like I was saying, a couple sentences, two, a paragraph, two paragraphs, a 10, 15 minute talk of half an hour to an hour talk, and then the whole paper. I just, I, there's, you've got to be able to communicate your idea in, in, in ways people can understand. That's why scientific papers have an abstract at the beginning and a conclusion or discussion at the end. Yeah. Those are for you to get a feel of what, what this is about and do I actually need to read the whole paper? <laughs> yeah. And often you don't. It's actually, there's a little bit more than that. This is a reason why videos are harder to get information across. Yeah. And a paper's got the abstract, great, what is this about? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's kind of what they, oh, that's something I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. Here's the conclusion, that tells me a little bit. And then where are the four significant figures so I can actually just look at the data rather than having to wade through everything. Yes. So... That's why that's why those things are, are, are built that way. So yeah, um, complicated ideas have to be able to be con conveyed in a way that people can understand them easily sure. until you get to other people who want to have the complicated version of it, and then you can actually have a complicated version of it. You know, I, I've always been garrulous, talkative. I, I had all those things written on my report cards that my dad always saw. And I had a terrible tendency that I wanted to tell him a story. And I had this whole thing in my mind. I'm going to tell him the story. And he would always stop me and say, tell it to me in two sentences. Right. And I'd get so mad. I was like, ah, oh! it's like, there's so much to tell you. Because that's one. <laughs> I'm just like, ah, oh! and it's like, I'm just like, never mind. He goes, that's two. And I just walk away and I tell my story to someone else that cared. It's like, it was so, I mean, I was, yes, mentally challenged or abused as a kid. Let's yeah. just call it that. It was, it was yeah. tough. But, yeah. Um, and, and none of that, none of that should make anybody feel frustrated. Yeah. I, th I think, I mean, I understand when people get frustrated for, uh, because I've got this idea and it makes so much sense to me and I think it will make a difference. And I think that's great and important you got to be able to express it in a way that other people can absorb can make, can make sense of. Yeah. You know, and if, in, 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 if in working that out, um, you know, there've been lots of things that I've started to work on mm -hmm. and, you know, I, I write, you know, 4,000 words and it's like, Oh really? Only these hundred words make any sense. Yeah. You know, I yeah. hear it's done. I, there's no, there's no article needed here. It's mm -hmm. a paragraph and we're out, uh, you yeah. know, um, I hate everybody... coming across articles with the abstract and there's no information after abstract. I'm like, oh, it's like, okay, thanks for the teaser. It's like, and, but it might be behind a paywall or it's university only or something. I'm like, yeah, I need you to know often... more. There's nothing left on that page. From yeah. Me. You can often take the title of that paper and put it into Google and mm -hmm. find the PDF somewhere. Ah. Um, you can, you can poke around and it's yeah. usually there. Okay. Um, yeah. So there. I'm going to repeat myself and I don't need to, right? I don't need yeah. to go on. I've right. said it. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. All righty. Um, any news from your tanks you want to share with the, with the audience? Anything cool going on? Baby Acropora is in here. That's kind of cool. How small? Oh, it's just three polyps, four polyps. Like literally like dots. Yeah. They're, they're, I can, I can, I can see them pretty easy now nice. without a microscope. So that's nice. How old are they? What is the date? 17th uh, of February. Almost two months, I guess. Okay. 
Yeah, two months. And these the babies oldest... are from Spawn. From Spawn. Not from and... Fragging a Polyp. <laughs> no. Um, some of them are from Gravids that I got from the Great Barrier Reef last year. Nice. Uh, and some of them are from corals that we spawned in 2020 wow. that I raised up here, mm -hmm. and they spawned this year. So I have F2 babies, nice. wow. which I'm really excited about. That's and I'm going to cool. do it. I'm doing it differently this year. I'm going to get the corals earlier this year, mm -hmm. like next month, nice. and let it go and see what happens. Nice. Because see those those ones up there, they spawn so good and so healthy compared to the most more recent acquisitions. Yeah. So I'm I'm having a feeling that boy oh boy, having them be settled for a year to spawn is probably might might be see see what I'm doing. I don't want anybody to go away and go. Rich says they got to live for a year. This is my hypothesis, my mind story, and now I'm going to see if it works or not. Yeah, yeah. Nice. With an end of one. <laughs> <laughs> Great. All right, yeah. let's uh let's jump to um our next slide. Uh, actually, we should do this for a little bit here cuz Rich, we've only been talking for an hour and a half. I am at your service. Let us go to huh, I'm not prepared. I'm going to have to modify this on the fly. How, why should today be different than any other I know, street, right? Yours. <laughs> we can do this. We can do that one. What and... one? What are you talking about? Oh, oh, I see. You're not talking to me at all. You're doing I'm stuff. trying to figure out how to do this. This is just too much work here. <laughs> this is not, I'm not prepared because I don't do this usually with a second person. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I can leave. No, no, because you might need to answer the questions. I, I don't have answers. You have answers. You have mind answers. Mind Let's answers. <laughs> so we can do that, and we'll change this. No, there's two of me. It's stuffy in here. Do this. I'll put Rich right there. It's the hundred gallons of the, the two hundred gallons of water in this room, humidating me up right now. Nice. Because I closed all the doors. Yeah. Because I'm a professional. Because you're trying to stop the noise from outside. Uh, sure. <laughs> let's put this guy right here and put you right here. All right, let's do some questions from the audience. Let me scroll way up to the top okay. where it says, hello, hello, hi, 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 hello. Yeah, Casual I'm trying reef... to look at the question. So, uh, Casual Reef I'm... Keeping says, am I lost? Are we getting a taste of reef beef on Saturday? You are lost. <laughs> <laughs> Brian Zagorian says, hey, Mark and Rich. Hey, Brian. Uh, Elaine oh, says, I've tried stand up, try any joke in front of friends first, because what you may think is hilarious to you is not always funny to everyone else. That's true. Very true. Yeah. Um... <laughs> I was wondering why this was here. I saw it in the corner of my eye. What? It what said, is it? Good afternoon, roofers. And I was like, why are people talking about roofs on this channel? I was really confused there for a minute. <laughs> Roofiers. <laughs> See, it's right here. The roofing reefers? <laughs> a roofing live stream would be boring, I would think. It just it, they just took off in the chat. It's like, oh my goodness. <laughs> a reef on the roof would certainly be closer to nature. That is true. Hey, Rich, are you able to do any outside reef keeping outside of your property, like in the weather? Do you have decent climate control to where you could handle that or no? <clears throat> Uh, it, it can get down to 30 in the winter. Um, my sump, my life support's all in the crawl space under the house. So that's essentially outside. Yeah, um, uh, and I'm playing, and I also have a frag tank out there as well. Uh, but that's under the house. So it's not out. It's not I don't truly have enough, like a sunlit reef, basically. Yeah, I don't, if we get, I'm toying with the idea. I've got two ideas. One is to get rid of the chicken coop and put a greenhouse out there. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think I don't think that's actually how I like to reef. Yeah. You know, if I have to go there yeah. to do it, I won't. Yeah. Um, but my wife, who is amazing, my bride, has figured out a possible way for me to put another tank in my living room. Mm -hmm. um, so, and that, depending on how that goes, that tank actually might be quasi outside. So we'll see. We I just don't we just don't have space. We don't yeah. have land outside of the house like uh, you do in Tejas. Well, I know in Southern California they do it. In Florida they do it. Texas our weather is kind of 
really hot or really yeah. cold. So even though it's kind of this really cool idea I'd like to do, I just don't think I think it's doomed to fail from the from the start. I just don't think it's yeah, possible. It's too for you it gets too hot and too cold. Yeah. 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 Let's see. Um Atkins says to check your check valve. <laughs> check your check valve. <laughs> Let's see. Hey, you had the best use of a check valve. The reverse check valve. The reverse yes. check valve that yeah. wasn't, you know, that's a great you know. Works to this day. It's been, I've, I've, I've had it for 11 years. I've had to replace it once just because it started to stick. Yeah. I used them a lot. And then it was just like, I am not taking these apart as often as they need to be taken apart. So what's right. the point? Yeah. Let's see. Um, Mitch said. Uh, Mitch Carl? The, the best and worst. <laughs> the best and worst part of this isn't just the hobby generally. It's every single sub aspect too. Learning lighting, same thing. Keeping Fido, same thing. Feeding specific fish, same thing. There's just so much being debated. Other fields use established best practices to help fight the mountain of stupidity. Yet the more you learn, the more you find best practices are situational. I agree with all that. Yeah, that's tough. Uh, I'd like there to be best practices. Yeah. Uh, I tried to do some of that. Um, but there's uh, the the hobby and trade and industry also tends to eat itself. Yeah. Uh, people don't want best practices because that means they'll have to do something differently. Yeah. Um, so it, it's really hard. Um, I went to a reptile show recently mm -hmm. and I realized that's what reefing shows seem to want to be, but they mm -hmm. can't be that because you can go to a reptile show and for 500 bucks, go home with everything you need, including the animal and have a real reasonable chance of keeping it alive long term. Yeah. Reefing is not like that. No, it's, it's there's just too like you were saying, like Mitch was saying, there's so many moving parts. Yeah. So uh, it's tough. I mean, that's what's one of the exciting parts of it, I think, is that, oh, well, now I get to learn about this thing that I, right. you know, now I get to learn about flow more. Now I get to learn about lighting more. Cooper says, I've been wanting to get a reef set up for some time. Wonder if I could ask some questions. This is the time. Do it right now. Now we're in the Q&A. Um, Elaine says she encountered a very aggressive worm in her Tampa Bay shipment and had no idea if it was a bobbit, but wasn't going to take a chance. Yeah, so it wasn't a bobbit worm. Richard wasn't uh, a bobbit. It was a unicid worm. There's a million of them. The bobbit worms don't live in reef tanks. They don't live in coral. They live in muck, and they're very long, and yeah. they're thicker than my thumb. Yeah, and they're really strong and really fast. They're just, they're just not, they're just not anywhere where they can be collected. Mm -hmm. Unicid worms, all over the place among the reef, and yeah. some of them got uh, nasty bites. Mm -hmm. uh, they do. So, yeah. Um, but if you get a crazy worm, let me know, because I like crazy stuff. <laughs> also, she noted that uh, Ick does make ginger go away. Got it. Ick makes ginger go away. I love it. <laughs> Let's yeah, I, haven't, I, I haven't yet had a ginger infestation that I've needed to fight off yet, but now I know how to do it with <laughs> cryptocarrion. <laughs> it's the best. That's your abstract right there. Let's see. <laughs> Uh, lots of talk about ginger. I don't know what we did today, but we definitely woke up the ginger people. Actually, we have a person on this channel. There she is, the Zen Ginger. She she comes in here every week. She yeah, says hello. I, I'm not going to try to convince people not to do ginger. It's, you know, it's you do whatever you like. It's your tank. Let's see. Jack, stop. Um, Rick suggests that we should have you and Andre on to talk about the reef moonshiners method of trace dosing, trace element dosing. I'll talk to anybody. And Chris Colt is apparently one of your fans. Go reef beef, beef nation, beef nation, beef nation. Beef the, nation. Those are the RBU, the reef beef universe, as somebody said, that made me laugh a lot. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Reef beef university. Let's see. Um, okay, Mario says, I started my cycle seven days ago with dry rock, ocean direct sand, and a shrimp seven days ago, and ammonia does not go past 0.25, and 5 ppm ammonia has been like that normal. That makes no sense. You said ammonia twice. Um, but you do need ammonia to rise. What would your goal be, Rich, if you're trying to cycle a tank? Do you want to hit 5 ppm as the 
the first threshold? It's been so you long. You know, I got to be honest. The last time I cycled a tank and paid attention to what the cycle was doing yeah. was 30 years ago. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I think five is that number you want to hit, you know, like three to five. If you don't yeah. hit that, the cycle takes forever to get going, if I remember correctly. Yeah, and what I – my recommendations on a new tank is uh, get some goo or a rock or – you know, some kind of biomedia that's in somebody else's tank mm -hmm. that you are, um, that you think is a good bomber tank and uh, throw that in your new tank and just let that inoculate your tank. Yeah. And then, and then wait a couple months and test. Yeah. But, but, but my opinion is you're setting up a tank, you're not putting anything in it for a couple months anyway. So while it's interesting to chart what the ammonia does, and I think everyone should, you mm -hmm. should do that once yeah. at least. Um, I, even, even at the Academy with new systems where they would test once a week or whatever, yeah. I, I would never really look at the number. It's like, oh yeah, there's ammonia. <laughs> you know, I charted mine, um, when I did Caitlin's reef, uh, almost two years ago and yeah. I was doing it for the YouTube channel. So I was, I was great, just keeping great track every single day and I shared, it was like, it said day one, day five, day 17, you know, and it literally showed the different test kits. It was just my simple way instead of doing a graph. Yeah, because, that's great. Yeah, you know, that'd be kind of fun to show that. Yeah, that's um, all. All of that stuff, like I was saying at the beginning, needs to be done over and over again for new people. Yeah. What, why a new person would go back and look at an article I wrote ten years ago? Yeah. There's, you know, or twenty. That, that, that's probably <laughs> shut the hell up. Shut up. I'm not twenty years old. No. Um, <laughs> yeah, it needs. It all I was needs wondering what just happened. <laughs> It all needs to be redone in a new way with a yeah. new look at it right. uh, for newer people. I think it's great. Yeah, that's funny. Uh, Chris wants to know if you have a beef today. I, I, uh, just that I spilled a bunch of water on my floor is my beef today. Uh, no, I think the whole, uh, I, I, the whole critical thinking uh, is generally a beef I have, mm -hmm. but I'm trying not to couch it as a beef. Um, I, I want people to get that it's useful yeah. instead of onerous, instead of a pain in the butt. Yeah, yeah. Um, Mackenzie asks, lighting intensity for a softy tank using two radions. Yeah. What would you say? <laughs> I would say medium. I know that's very generic, but it's a softy tank and softies don't have a big demand for lighting. So having your lights running around 50% might be a good starting point. You could watch how the corals respond. And if they're really stretching upward, like they're elongating, then maybe increase your lighting you know, another 5 or 10% and then see if they kind of yeah. start to spread out and hug the rock work better. That would be my thought. That sounds right. And, and you know, you probably don't even need a PAR meter anymore, generally, yeah. uh, because you can find what the PAR distribution is through water on most lights nowadays anyway so you yeah. can figure 50 percent of that is about this and you'll probably be okay softies are they can be pretty uh forgiving mm -hmm. so um yeah, medium yeah. yeah that's what i said medium <laughs> medium now softies will take whatever you give them right they come mm -hmm. from the same place as uh, the stony corals come from um so maybe the idea of medium is more to acclimate them up to a higher light if you want to have them a higher light yeah uh, Michael says, can I put an algae scrubber on a new build or should I wait for the cycle? And I'm going to say definitely let the cycle be do its thing before you start dealing with trying to grow algae inside a scrubber. I would wait yeah. till like three or four months in. I mean, it's just it's too soon. You don't have a lot of nutrients in the tank for the scrubber to work with. Sounds right to me. You're, you're, you're fighting yourself by trying to have the scrubber scrub. Because you want your biological filtration is is should be doing the heavy lifting in your tank. And um, we don't know what that really means. We don't know what diversity is. We, we don't know any of it, but it's like making a stew. You know, you put the ingredients in and you leave it alone for yeah. a while and let, let it, it simmer. settle, let it simmer and settle down. Yeah. And then you should be in a much better place to be able to start making things happen. Is a soup better? Is a soup a better one or a stew? Which is better? I, I love metaphors, so. Uh, and I couldn't decide if soup was a, a smarter I, one. I would food. go with spaghetti sauce because <laughs> the sauce you need to let sometimes sit for a long time. Oh, a sauce. You know? Yeah, okay. A sauce. A cookie. No. Uh, 
let's see. Uh, someone asked here earlier, if Rich is the mind answers, what is Mark's answers? <laughs> yeah, Mark. It's like mine are apparently they're Mark stories <laughs> since you have yeah. mind and answers. I, and I hope I was clear. I have my own mind stories too. And I feel very compelled by them and can give you the evidence about why I think the mind story. I think that's more important than the mind story itself. Yeah. Is what what is your support for the story you are telling me? Yeah. Well, that's, that's the critical that, thinking. That's, that's the most the important part. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Sweet. We are done. No, I know. <laughs> um, Tom says, I cycle fish quarantines. Oh, he's, I think he's answering a quarantine thing. Uh, I cycle fish quarantines with bottled bacteria, hardware store ammonia, and Seacom ammonia alert badges. One milliliter, 10% ammonia per 10 gallons. And once the badge goes to zero, I dose it again. Okay. Uh, That's and- great. You know, I, I don't do recipes like that. I love that other people do, though. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, go for it. People want to know. Do watch out for the ammonia alert badges. I uh, I had one where the... Um, oh, look, somebody actually said that. Yep. I had one where the disc actually came off. And... Um, yeah. Because of where it was, Mm -hmm. uh, there was coralline algae or there was a rock behind it that uh, I thought it was just uh, uh, in the right level. Right. Um, And it took me a week to realize that there was actually no badge there. Oh, jeez. That's not good. Yeah. Uh, Winterwater wants to know, is it normal for a chalice to bubble up? And I think you're talking about like a chalice is becoming a bounce chalice or something. That's a rich question. No, chalices generally don't bubble. Their tissue is generally wants to stay yeah. right on the skeleton. Um, so it could be indicative of all kinds of issues. Um, so the answer is no. Lack of uh, potassium. Like, could be lack of <laughs> potassium. Could be. Yeah. Could be. Anecdotally, yeah, no, 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 I added some potassium and stuff is looking better. Yeah. Makes me want to die. But I know it could, it, it's, it's likely not the potassium. Yeah. It's likely the months of whatever's been happening that are yes. just realizing itself now. But it yeah. could be the potassium, but someone's going to have to show me that the potassium can make that much of a difference quickly. Yeah. No, that makes For sense. For me to be compelled. Right. It was crazy, Rich. When I when my tank had a big crisis, remember, I called you up the day yeah, before and said, what do I do with these ICP results? And your answer was send in another sample. <laughs> I was like, I don't have time for that. My reef is dying. I need a solution. Am I going to dose based on this? You're like, nope. I was like, okay, now what? I get you. Nope, but yours yours was a particularly awful situation. Yeah. Because the, the thing to do is do massive water changes. Yeah. And, and if they the were salt making it worse. <laughs> and if the salt mix is making it worse, yeah. you're making it worse. Yeah. That's a, that's, there's just nothing to be done in that situation except yeah. fight through it and get to the other side. Yeah. Uh, I'll, t- I'll give you guys an update real quick about Caitlin's reef. Um, so I, I got the uh, UV sterilizer I told you guys about, and I still haven't opened it. But the dinoflagellates have already receded quite a bit, I'd say by 50% in the tank, just with the other things I did. So what I did was I filled up the little cartridge with carbon and let it absorb what it could from the water column. I've been dosing phytoplankton like every couple of days in the tank. Um, I've done zero water changes on the tank. I mean, it's just... Rich, I don't know if you saw any of the pictures I posted, but it was really like dust on the sand. It just was not bad. It was not the snotty stuff I'm used to seeing. It's osteoporosis, osteopsis. That's what it is, osteopsis. Not osteoporosis. Not osteopsis of the the, uh, corals. (laughs) 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 It's a hard one. I say that wrong every time. I had to read it out loud to say it right. But I am going to hook up the UV also to get rid of the last of it because I don't want to return. Because apparently that's a, an ongoing thing. Like you solve dinos and then they're back. Or you or they come back with a totally different strain. It's like, how? You know, where is this DNA coming from that's like suddenly converting it to a way worse one or whatever? So. I squint a little bit at all of that. Well, I mean, in the end, have you had to fight in any of your tanks ever, Rich? Yeah. And what was your yeah. solution? How did you solve it? I, uh, it was a newer tank. I turned off the lights for five days Mm -hmm. and I did a massive water change and I stirred everything up and that was it. Yeah. 
Yeah, blowing everything off to kind of get in suspension so the filtration can catch it. Osteoporosis. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I with cyano and stuff like that, most of the time I tend to just let it run its course and burn mm -hmm. itself out. Burn itself out, yep. Well, this one been going on for a while. So about once a week, I was doing a, a good cleaning with you know a, a gravel vac, trying to remove what I could. But within a matter of days, it started building up again. That's when I got the microscope to look. And I was like, okay, now at least I know what I have specifically. What's the game plan? And it was, you know, you know there were specific tips, but the UV sterilizer was the one. Because apparently, from what I've read, this one, when the lights are off, because it acts like cyano, it goes invisible. And then when the lights are on, it becomes dark. It said that during the lights off, it's swimming. It's free swimming. So that's why the UV can get it. And I was like, oh, well, I need a UV. So I asked my local fish store to pick one up, which he did. But I was so busy with coral, I couldn't even hook it up. And then right. when I finally finished with coral, I was so tired, it took a couple days to relax. Yeah. So now I'm, here it is, another week later, I still haven't hooked it up, and I paid $185 for this thing. I need to use it. Got to get my money's worth. And I need to kill when some UV. Yeah, let's kill, some, kill some UV. Kill some ostropsis. <laughs> it better work too. Yeah, I hope it. Well, I've heard it will, so I'm not. I'm not concerned. It's not going to work. I think it will. And worst See, case, think, I'll have it for a quarantine tank in the future. Yeah, I think it'd be cool to get real answers with the with the dino stuff. Um, you know, I'd like to see people just use UV or just use the other remediation program. Yeah, you know, and see what happens and get yeah. some real get some real feeling of what is actually making the difference or not. Well, what I want is an article in Coral Magazine that delves into how do people solve dinoflagellates in 2024? Because that's just not been a, a topic for, you know, it's just more like there's a support group on Facebook or two or three. And, you know, people are trying everything they can to solve it. And there's at least a lot of people are buying microscopes and we're getting, we're starting. It's sort of like when you got more people to buy power meters to start learning numbers. Don't, don't support big microscope. It's all a scam from big microscope trying to get your money. Mine was a little microscope. It, it had yeah. one eyepiece, not two. Once you get yeah. two, you're really sucked in by big, big microscope. <laughs> <laughs> you're funny. Um, all right. Well, that was it. They didn't have a lot of questions for us today. So, Rich, let me wrap up the show here for us so that we can go about our day. Don't right go on. Don't Thanks go for on. having me. This was fun. I'm glad you came on. I've been wanting to have you on for a while. And uh, I appreciate you giving up a Saturday afternoon with me or, or a lunchtime, I guess it is for you. Yeah, yeah, my That's pleasure. Right. It was yeah. really fun. Let me put this on here for a second, Rich. And I'm probably going to have the wrong camera. Oh, look, it's not a black square. I did good. So, guys, I want to remind you that today is Water Test Saturday. You know, we talked about all these things. And really, ultimately, if you don't know the numbers, then how on earth do you know what your tank needs? So it is important that you grab all your test kits and use them before they expire. And we want to know what the numbers are, make some corrections, or if everything's working well, just pat yourself on the back for doing a good job. Thank you so much for tuning in this week. I will see you again next week. And uh, thank you so much, Rich, for coming on the show with us because it was really fun interacting with you. I really did enjoy that. And I would like to have you come on again when your paper is published so we can then dissect it and find out what's wrong with it. <laughs> okay, I would love that. That would be fun. We're not going to dissect it. <laughs> if it gets published and everyone reviews it and they all love it, that's just going to be one more thing that helps us. You're going to laugh at this paper when you see it. Yeah? Based on the discussion we had today. Okay. All right. There, there, there's a section. I don't know if it actually made it, but it's uh, TLDR. Yeah. Uh, I don't I don't know if that's stayed in or if I changed it to, um, you know, conclusions. Uh-huh. <laughs> you might have put that in there, huh? I might have put that in there. That's funny. Because I, mean, I was like, it's got to be, what is, what is, here's a bunch of statistics. That's not helping anybody except people who like statistics. Yeah. What are you taking away from this? Yeah. That's what I'm looking at. You know, I, um, I've seen people start their post with TLDR. I'm like, no, that goes at the bottom. It's at the end. <laughs> you can't put the top. <laughs> Oh, you you start at the top, the that means keep scrolling. Never mind. If you, yeah. If you put it at the top, it's like the abstract. <laughs> yeah, but the text went forever. I'm like, no, you did it all well, wrong. Well, well there's also got to be two sentences. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, where's the two-sentence intro? What the heck? My dad would be so disappointed. Love it. Love Rich, it. thanks so much. All right, guys. Bye. Have a great weekend and test your water. Bye, everyone.